So I'll open it up to um, questions. Uh, if anybody has any questions, just kind of raise your hand like that and I'll try to call on you and you can unmute yourself. Uh, Tom May, why don't you go ahead? You can unmute yourself there. I just wonder, uh, Dr. Springer, in the way you, you present the kind of ambivalence, the love-hate that um, Luther expresses um, subsequent to his visit to Rome, whether it would make sense to distinguish between, if we might, um, Catholic religion in terms of practice and Catholic faith, and whether, whether Luther maintains the latter while rejecting so many aspects of the former. Yeah, I think that's a, a good distinction. Um, and I think it's often uh, bothered or made biographers of Luther stumble. Um, he is such a complicated figure. His thought is uh, often so paradoxical and his ideas develop over the course of his life. Unlike Melanchthon, who was perhaps more consistent as a theologian, Luther really um, doesn't develop a systematic theology. Um, but at the core of his, his religious, what, what really is his faith, is this uh, belief that the gospel uh, is itself able to do just about everything without a lot of uh, human intervention. Um, and I think that, that maybe that principle animates a lot of what he has to say and, and informs a lot of his dissatisfaction with the, the elaborate superstructure that had been built over the foundation of Christian faith over the centuries, um, including things like indulgences or, or pilgrimages, which actually got in the way uh, of the very thing that the church supposedly was trying to promote, namely repentance and faith and, and belief in the gospel. So I think that's a, that's a very good distinction. Did he visit St. Paul's outside the walls that we know, for example, since Paul features so greatly in his in his theology, uh, we we don't know that he went to that church. He doesn't mention that church. Yeah, that I, I know, no. but I just wonder um, whether there is, in any sense, um, a sense be, which is behind pilgrimage of sacred place. Is sac is the idea of a sacred place? And I, I have to add parenthetically, think of how many people made Luther pilgrimages in 2017. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think um, something like uh, 2 million people went to Wittenberg in 2017. So what would Luther I know what Luther would have thought of that. <laughs> but he does mention the, uh, the Tre Fontane, which is farther down the Appian Way from uh, St. Paul's, outside the walls. Right. Um, and um, or he mentions the fact that the legends about Paul's death, where his head is supposed to have bounced three times after he was decapitated, creating three fountains each time it hit the ground. He calls that all a damnable lie, or, or he, he has very strong language about that particular legend. Uh, nonetheless, he, he has absolutely no doubt that Paul <coughs> died in Rome because in the, in the last chapter of Acts, it seems clear that that's the case. Right. He wrestles with the, the question of Peter's martyrdom in Rome throughout his life. Uh, and he, he can't quite make up his mind. Uh, many of his contemporary reformers believed that Peter had never been to Rome. Um, but there, was, there were so many legends and so many uh, accounts of, specific accounts of what happened to Peter in Rome, including the Church of Quo Vadis outside of Rome. Um, the, um, um, I don't think he could ever quite shake the idea that um, Luther was, that, that Paul was, that, that Peter was martyred there. Um, by the way, I got the, the Appian Way is where Quo Vadis is. The, the, the road towards Ostia is where uh, St. Paul's is, just to get that clear. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Rome, but I don't want to give you any 
any wrong information. It's, it's, um, it's well worth visiting if you haven't been there to visit the catacombs and to uh, see the sites that, that Luther says that he saw. Um, I wish that we had a, a bigger and, and more full account of what exactly he was doing while he was there, but we can still sort of piece together uh, some aspects of what he saw. He talks about the Pantheon, for instance, the Colosseum. He mentions uh, San Pancrazio, uh, but he doesn't mention St. Paul outside the walls. Okay, uh, looks like Norton Wheeler has a question there. If you can unmute yourself, Norton. Ah, I tried to hit the red sign. I had to hit the blue sign. Um, so a uh, uh, non-expert question, obviously. Uh, did Luther ever go to Jerusalem? And if so, can you offer any com comparative commentary on those influences? He if never not, did. why not? <laughs> he never went to Jerusalem. Um, and... Uh, I think uh, this was the biggest trip he ever made in his life. Uh, he went to Leipzig, he went to Cologne, um, he went to Augsburg, but uh, this, this was the trip of his life and he was pretty much a homebody. One reason for that, uh, Nordy, was um, it was very dangerous for him to leave uh, Saxony <laughs> um, because he was a, a wanted man uh, after 1521. So he risked his life he would, he would have been executed, I'm sure, if he'd gone back to Rome or tried somehow to get from Wittenberg to Jerusalem. So it wasn't even a possibility. He talks about Jerusalem quite a bit and, and at one point says, well, second only to Jerusalem. Rome is a great holy city, but Jerusalem's obviously the, the head of, of Christianity. That's where, that's where Jesus was crucified. That's where the first church was. So uh, he never uh, doubts that Jerusalem should have priority uh, in this um, hierarchy of churches. The fact is, though, since um, it was very difficult for pilgrims to get to Jerusalem through much of the Middle Ages, Rome, Canterbury, Compostela, these other sites in Western Europe became uh, default um, sources or sites for pilgrims to to go just because they, they couldn't go to Jerusalem. So going to Jerusalem, you really were risking a lot. Going to Rome was could be hazardous, but um, it was at least doable. Good question. Uh, Bonnie, go ahead. Actually, a uh, comment, uh, Professor Springer. Luther was very much uh, focused on repentance and daily repentance. And his early days as a monk, he was trying his best to make himself worthy in God's eyes uh, through repentance and fasting and whatever was necessary. But then he goes on to say that the law uh, drives you in, in desperation. The law will drive you to the gospel. And, and that he was then so focused on the idea of the good news that even later in his life, he was trusting on that good news and not the ritual that was involved in, in the law. If you want to expand on that at all, I thought that was really interesting in the book. You bring it up. Yeah, it's, um, I think when you start thinking about pilgrimages, on the one hand, um, places are very important for, for piety. Uh, and uh, I think as I've gotten older, I, I recognize that, that there are specific memories associated with places that, that make them, them very, very special in, in a, a believer's eyes. Um, and it's hard to dispute that. Um, 
I think one, one of the most interesting things that I experienced was when we visited the Church of the Holy Cross in Rome. And uh, you can see all of the, the how many of you have been there? Uh, it's one of the seven churches. It's, it's got pieces of the Holy Cross. It's got a nail. It's got a crown of thorns, all these different things. And, um, and you could get so and so many points, uh, so many years off of purgatory for each one of those very mechanical kind of process that Luther found disgusting. But at the same time, a little, there was a little uh, message, a little plaque underneath all of these relics. And the plaque said in Italian, um, you know, the important thing isn't whether these actually are the, the pieces of the true cross or the, 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 a real nail. The important thing is that you think about what um, what happened on that cross. And I, I think that's, if, if seen in that site, uh, even Luther would have said a, a pilgrimage might not be a bad idea. And later in life, um, you know, he, he didn't absolutely forbid the idea of pilgrimage, but it, it certainly couldn't happen with, without that larger context in mind. Uh, but I think that's a way, as I've gotten older, <clears throat> that I've uh, I visited Rome many times, and I, I find myself moved uh, visiting the catacombs. I find myself moved going to Wittenberg, which is kind of a dumpy town. Rome, at, Rome at least, is really exciting, and there's really good food in Rome. Um, uh, Wittenberg is um, not quite so overwhelming. Um, and, and so, but it doesn't really matter. What, what matters is the memories that you've connected with places and so in this book, I've tried to talk a little bit about what Rome has come to mean for me. Um, my daughter lives in Rome. Um, her husband runs a restaurant down south of the Aventine Hill. My wife takes students to Rome. She's in Rome right now with students. Um, we, we go to Rome regularly. And the city really has grown on me. Uh, but that's not to say it's an easy city. It's smelly. It's um, crime-ridden. It's got all sorts of problems, but there's something about the, the continuity of the centuries, its historicity, the fact that you go by the theater of Marcellus and, and there's people, there's an Airbnb on the top level. You are right in the middle of the past. And I think that was very important for Luther, this, this historicity of the city. This is this is where the Christian church uh, in Europe uh, really was founded, and this is its basis. And I don't think he, he ever forgot that, and that's why he kept talking and thinking about Rome, even, even very negatively, right up until the last words of his life. Yeah, I think that he always considered Rome as a mother. Yeah, and then what do you do when your mother turns out to be um, less virtuous than, than you maybe thought? Um, so, so there may have been, in the book I suggest, there might even have been a kind of uh, what you might call a post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, where when you suddenly, you love something so much, you're devoted to something so much. Luther was a member of the Roman Catholic Church. He was a priest. Um, and then suddenly, for over half of his life, suddenly to have that broken off, uh, that's, that's not easy, psychologically speaking. I think what's happened is that a couple hundred years later, we have Protestants who never uh, had anything to do with Rome. And for them, it was very easy just to be anti-Roman, of course. But for Luther, Luther was anti-Roman. There's no question about it. He says some terrible things about Rome, and he means it. But it may be the same kind of angry things that a teenager says to his mother or father when, when things aren't going right, and he discovers that his former heroes are, have feet of clay. Uh, so a great sense of disappointment um, and frustration is there, uh, I think, on the part of Luther, it, that you may not see that. Uh, really in later Protestants because they didn't have that close relationship with this holy place. I think Thank that's you. 
I think that's a great point because, you know, they say the opposite of love is not hate. It's, it's apathy, right? So he's not apathetic towards Rome at all. No, he's not. <laughs> um, does Bernie am, am I, or Helga, am I seeing your, your hand raised there? First of all, thank you for a very informative and interesting talk. My question is the, the, um, the legends and the rituals, you know, climbing the Scala Sancta, saying the, saying the Our Father, where did those come from? Was there some sort of, you know, body that was saying, you know, pay this much and go here and this is what you'll get? Was there any sort of table of regulations? regulations or you know having been a tourist you get off the you get off the train and you're immediately assaulted by all sorts of people trying to give you tours and so I'm just curious as the basis of some of these uh, mythological things that Luther was debunking later yeah there's there's some um, uh, long-standing legends um, many of them uh, connected with these relics that end up in Rome, uh, going all the way back to Constantine's mother who brought the true cross back to Rome. And over the years, all sorts of things show up in Rome and, and Luther and others make fun of this. Um, I think it's uh, Erasmus who says, look, if, if you were to put all the pieces of the true cross in, in one ship, it would fill an uh, entire ship that and, and so it's and there's more than one head of john the baptist uh, so so the reformers had a lot of uh took a lot of pot shots at these legends some of them popular some of them maybe um uh, manipulative trying to get money from pilgrims come to our town come to our site don't go to the other site uh, because um we want you to spend money here um, and what body did this? I, I imagine it's the, the curia. The, over time, though, I think this, the, these, these traditions did evolve. And by Luther's time, they'd reached kind of a, a point where it was becoming absurd. And, and certainly, as, as uh, Bonnie was saying before, when, when these pious exercises become clearly just a way to make money, and there's no real repentance involved. It, it's atrocious from, from any spiritual perspective. I mean, Ignatius Loyola had spiritual exercises, but they, were, they weren't based about money. They were, they were exercises designed to help promote spirituality. But when you can just buy an indulgence, pay for it, stay in Wittenberg, instead of going to Rome, instead of doing any of these things, just pay... Um, then it really becomes uh, an abuse that's obvious to everybody. And I think even the Roman Catholic Church realized this, and the Council of Trent uh, goes very seriously into reform itself, uh, trying to clean up its act and make sure that they got back to the basis of um, repentance and faith in the gospel and not, not money. So it's a very good question. The, the legends um, are almost mind boggling uh, in their details. And also then from, from a modern perspective, it's very hard for me to believe in, in them at all. Uh, and Luther wasn't modern in some senses, but he, he shared my skepticism. Um, there's, there's been a lot of archeological research. Uh, there, there's a great discussion about whether Peter's bones are really underneath the Vatican. You, you can go back and forth on that. There, there certainly is some basis for these legends, but the legends themselves in their details are, are just from my perspective, un unbelievable. I, I, I mean, I, I wasn't going for spiritual redemption, but in Siena, you know, you can, drop coins into a slot and see Catherine of Siena's head you know you drop your coins in and it illuminates for you know a few seconds and then shuts down and you can the the the, the fingers of uh, of Catherine in Trieste same uh, in in Trier I mean you you know you drop a few coins in and the light comes on and you can actually see the fingers it's uh, an experience anyway who knows whether it's true or, 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 or whose fingers those are actually, right? Thank you. 
Okay. Um, looks like we have more questions. Uh, if Dr. Springer's uh, okay with answering a few more, sure, we'll sure. take a few more. Uh, how about Edgar Schick there? Go ahead, Edgar. Oh, good morning. One of the things that has struck me from your presentation and other observations over the years is that we must not forget that vast, that most of the people at the time of Luther could not read. Moreover, they could not travel. Today, we can read, we can watch television, we see the, the documents that you have presented, we can watch a TV series about Rome or any other place. And the many images, the uh, sacred uh, relics that were presented and are still there. You go to the Church of the 14 Saints in the Northern Bavaria, wherever you want to go, were meant, or the church where Luther was baptized, mm -hmm. uh, were all around the front of the balcony are pictures from the gospel and so forth and from and the Old Testament. These were all, and the steps, all tools for people who didn't have the opportunities, the observations, reading, travel that we have today. And they were real tangible, and the word is tangible, tangible tools for faith. Now, if they become simply things or other, other objects, then that's not what's important. But yes, there is a financial uh, uh, benefit and so forth for in many cases. But I think we don't dare forget the fact that that was a different time uh, when and even up into you know past centuries, you have people who couldn't read, couldn't travel, and the visual, the tangible, I can be in the presence of, meant much more to them then that such things mean to us today. That's a, that's a very important insight, and and I'm I'm thinking of um, not only Luther but Calvin and other reformers and the emphasis they placed on sola scriptura, um, really uh, Luther and others had an answer to this question. What's gonna replace the pilgrimage? What's gonna replace the tangible for the people? And his answer was, we're gonna teach them how to read and write, and we're gonna have them read the Bible. Um, and so this is um, the Biblia pauperum, the, Bib the Bible of the poor, which is what they called all the stained glass and the, the, the sculptures and everything else, uh, really is replaced by uh, Luther's small catechism, by the Bible above all, by his hymns. So it, it becomes words instead of things. And, and that's not to say that things didn't continue to play an important part in Luther's Reformation. He appreciated art and music. But in, the more, um, in other Protestant denominations, uh, the Bible almost became a thing. Um, and um, the, you know, music wasn't allowed or, or images were torn down. And so there, you, you've highlighted a really important difference between medieval um, religious spirituality and post-medieval uh, religion. Uh, and the Bible became much more important for, for Catholics as well uh, once, uh, once the Counter-Reformation had taken place. So thank you. Yes, that was a great, great point, Edgar. Thank you. Um, any other questions or observations? Uh, Stephen Brown, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Dr. Springer. Um, my, my wife and I have a, a special anniversary coming up this year, and I think he just decide, helped me to, to decide where we're going to go for our anniversary. So thank you very much. The, the name of the restaurant is La Billetta. It's, <laughs> Good, uh, it's uh, best Roman food in town. Uh, four special Roman pastas, and no, it's, um, I, I have to say, Luther never mentions the, the sensual delights of Rome that I, I really appreciate. Uh, he doesn't talk about gelato or pizza or uh, the, the food, Roman food is just terrific. And the area around Rome is, is so beautiful and delightful, the countryside. And the city on its best days is just uh, miraculous. Um, 
And so um, I, I have a love-hate relationship myself with the city, but it's, it's more love than hate. Um, be careful of your wallet. My wife's purse was stolen uh, the last time we were in Rome in December. So it, it, it isn't uh, trouble-free, but then what city today is trouble-free? I mean, be careful. I live in your, Baltimore. <laughs> yeah, be careful of your wallet in St. Louis too. So, um, so like any other city, it, it can uh, turn on you. Uh, but um, still, I think it's a great place to vacation. And it's, it's uh, the eternal city. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was interested to read about Freud uh, and Carl Jung, both psychologists who, who had real trepidation about visiting the city. They just couldn't, uh, it, was, it made them nervous. And part of what made them nervous was the, the, all of the, the deep archeological uh, depths of this city, like, like a human being, all these memories of childhood. And, and, and it's just uh, unlike other cities like London or Paris, uh, Berlin, also fascinating cities, but they don't have this continuity of the past blending into the present. And so it's a great city to visit, uh, especially if you're interested in, in history. Mm -hmm. uh, but Luther, I think at this stage in his life, didn't care, uh, wasn't thinking much about uh, scenery or tourism or culinary delights. Uh, he walks through the Alps, never mentions uh, that he's taken with the beauty of the Alps. Um, he, he just says, well, I, I, we took the safest route through the Alps. Uh, and boy, it sure would be hard to farm there. Um, he, he doesn't, uh, he, he doesn't, uh, he's not a tourist, in other words. He's, he's a pilgrim. And I imagine you might be uh, a little combination of both. But uh, he, 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 he uh, I think later in life, if he'd visited again, he might have spent more time uh, touring. He does visit the Forum, the Colosseum, the Pantheon. These are, these are not things that maybe your ordinary Augustinian monk would, would visit. And I talk about that in the book because I think that's part of his interest in, in the larger city of Rome, not just Roman Catholic Rome, but the Rome of the Caesars. And so he has this deep and abiding interest in the classics which is another reason the, the city continues to resonate with him uh, right up to the end of his life. Well, I, I enjoyed your, your lecture tremendously and thank, thank you. you very much. I, I would just like to say again, thank you to Dr. Springer. Um, and if you enjoyed today's lecture, like Bonnie said, please keep an eye out on the um, website for more upcoming events. Um, and please keep us in mind, um, you know, Normally we would, we would meet in person and we would charge a registration fee for today and that sort of thing. Um, so, so please think about uh, giving uh, to the Gritch Fund. It helps us uh, uh, have programs like this and to support uh, our, our Reformation Studies fellows uh, as well. Um, you can, uh, if you want more information about that, visit the website or you can uh, contact me or Bonnie uh, via email. Uh, we're happy to, to give you that information. This was our first virtual event. Um, and we were quite nervous, uh, but thanks to Randy and Helga and, and Bonnie and, and others, uh, we were able to pull it off. Um, and so we thank you for that. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Bonnie to, to say farewell. So once again, Dr. Springer, thank you so much. It was enlightening and it was delightful and for everyone bearing with us in this venture into the Zoom world.